good. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's afternoon here in Spain. <laughs> so, good afternoon. And welcome to, I think this is our 10th or 11th webinar, free webinar for teachers. And we're very lucky today to have Robin with us. Hello, Robin. <laughs> nice Hi, to see you. Everybody. And Robin's going to talk about imaging pronunciation, which I, for one, am fascinated to find out a little bit more about, about how to use images to help, uh, well, the, the description is there, but how to use images to help um, with uh, teaching pronunciation. Um, don't forget that uh, registration's now open for our um, convention in March in Oviedo, which is Robin's hometown, so you'll be able to see Robin there. Um, you can register online now, uh, so I suggest you get on with it because it's going to be a great one this year. And really, without further ado, I'll hand over to Robin, who's going to be uh, talking to us today. Welcome, Robin. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Thanks. I'll let you time. introduce yourself, if that's all right. <laughs> wow, well, I don't think there's much introduction to be done. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing my PowerPoint and switch okay. to video and audio so that you can you can get on with uh, with yours. Okay, uh, and I'll see you at the end. <laughs> so here we go. I share my PowerPoint. Yes. Uh, where is it? There it is. Um, yeah, it's there. Okay, so what I can't see is my own video. I don't know why that is. Mandy, is there a reason for my video disappearing? Um, you might need to change in the top right hand corner. Um, uh, speaker view, gallery view. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. It's it's very interesting, actually, because TESOL Spain is coming to Oviedo in 2019. It set me on thinking about <clears throat> how I got to where I am. And um, it's been 37 years since I arrived in Asturias and started teaching English, just quite a long time. Um, and the university in Oviedo was always interested had a very strong department, English department. And I quickly met with a colleague of my wife's who taught the phonetics course. And he was from Birmingham and I'm from Newcastle. And so we had quite different accents. And that was where I think the seeds were sown. So it's interesting that the conference is coming up to Oviedo because I can sort of begin to round off my, my professional life and um, speak about pronunciation, which has been a dominant theme in these past uh, 37 years since I, I started teaching English. Now the title is a reference to uh, a conference that started local in Barcelona called the Image Conference and has actually grown massively and has a huge following. I think the last Image Conference was in Greece this year. Um, that's a sort of expansion from a, a small local conference to what's now become a major international conference. When I saw the, the title of the conference, the Image Conference, I, was a, I felt a bit put out because, of course, my, my own special interest is pronunciation. Uh, and suddenly we're talking about, as initially my reaction was, Oh God, well, they talk about image, I talk about sound, and I've got nothing to do at their conference. And then sometime later, I realized, actually, that's not true, because we use image to help people work with sound. And that set me off organizing my thoughts on how we use image in the teaching of pronunciation. Um, and hence this webinar, and also the session that I gave in the annual conference in Madrid this year in March. But before I begin, I thought it'd be interesting to give you all a moment to actually think of yourselves about the sort of problems we constantly come across in, in pronunciation teaching. And in that case, oh, uh, hi Mandy, I hope you're there because this doesn't go forward for some reason. I am here, yes. Uh, <laughs> not, uh, I'm not sure why. Oh, oh, okay. It's gone that way. Okay, that'll do. That's fine. That's fine by me. It's moved. So my little problem I set for you, just so that we can get going, is um, how would you actually 
get somebody to do this sound if they couldn't, which was the case the other day with a Dutch colleague because the Dutch tend to use e where we would use a, and so sat becomes set, and mat becomes met, and hat becomes het, and things like that. Just give yourself, I'll give you 30 seconds, and if you're using the chat box, go ahead and use it, but um, how would you go about showing somebody how to do this sound? If you want to write in the chat box, I'd love to see what you would do. Anybody? Anyone out there? <laughs> Nothing coming in the chat box. How would you get a student to make the a ah sound who can't do it and is making e eh instead? Okay, thank you, Heather. Show them your mouth. Explain. Paco, thanks. What would you say in the explanation? Oh, that's nice, Paco, yeah. Talk about the tenseness. Oh, right, Chris, yeah. Actually, <laughs> get the... This is something we didn't have at the beginning. Some mouth drawings. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I did, I thought, well, what I'm going to do here is uh, go and see what the experts say. And, of course, the um, expert in terms of the pronunciation of English is Gimson. And because I started teaching really early, my edition of Gimson's from 1989. And I went to the particular sound, and Gimson told us this. Slightly more open than for E. And the front of the tongue is raised just below the half open position. Uh, just below the half open position, assuming I know what the half open position is. With the side rooms making very light contact with the back upper molars. And um, just going back through my notes when I studied dentistry. And the lips are neutrally open. Whatever neutrally open is. Not aggressively open or whatever. Um, but anyway, he goes on to help us further and says this. And perhaps he was thinking about me because I'm from the north of England and probably were lazy and sloppy and don't have much constriction in the pharynx. And I don't even know where the pharynx is, to be honest. The point is that this extremely detailed, extremely expert explanation of the sound actually didn't help me at all. I, I learned it off by heart to do my exam in phonetics at Oviedo University, but I wasn't really sure what it meant. Um, a similar explanation in another book I bought early on by Australians, Hook and Rowell, actually was slightly more accessible. This, this was written in Spanish at the back of the book for Spanish learners of English, but it, it's slightly more accessible, but it's still more or less in the same territory. And the point is that explanations written like this might be useful for phoneticians who already know how to make these sounds, but I'm not very sure that they're of a great deal of value to our students who won't have that background in phonetics and phonology and uh, may not even understand quite a lot of the lexus used in these explanations. This is my favorite explanation. It's from La Nueva España, which is a local newspaper published in Oviedo. It was done in the 90s. This was a course in English. And this really is superb. I haven't a clue what it's talking about. I really don't know what they mean when they put multiple H's and accented or unaccented A. And it seems to sum up this whole thing that working with sounds, it could just be that uh, descriptions and explanations are not the best way forward. The problem with sounds and the problem with pronunciation in general is that we are talking about skills acquisition. Hence the photographs of three people who are uh, actually at the top of their careers because of their ability to acquire skills. What's interesting when you watch them train is that there are very few explanations given. 
most of what happens is that they see people doing it or they see themselves doing it. Thanks for the references earlier to using selfie cameras. But the actual verbal explanation of how to serve in tennis or how to synchronize your swimming or how to swerve a football, we don't see a lot of this in other areas where the dominant aim is skills acquisition. And pronunciation is far more about skills than your formal knowledge, certainly more about skills than the formal knowledge I had as I answered questions on phonetics and phonology on the degree course at Oviedo University. Um, the other thing about pronunciation is tied into this uh, cone of experience by Edgar Dale, that it isn't about what we read in a book. It's very much about what we hear. It, if we take in images, is about what we see, and hopefully is about what we see and hear. And so by bringing images in, it's my feeling that we're going to strengthen the learning. And this is, as I say, reflected in the ideas in, in Dale's cone of experience. Another thing which I think needs taking into account is that we are, I know there are discussions and controversies about this, but there, there does seem to be some sort of difference between types of learner. And let's stay with the idea of left and right brain learners. And left brain learners like myself, um, we tend to look for the logic and we're looking for facts and we think in words. And we're quite staggered actually when we watch people learning to dance and to sing on programs like Operacion Triunfo, these TV programs where people go out and uh, perform in public. But people who are performing are more right brain. They're creative. They think holistically. They go for rhythm. They visualize. And these people would be excluded in pronunciation teaching if we excluded images from our pronunciation teaching. And all of us actually are a bit left and a bit right and perhaps more right than left. So my argument is we, we, we all benefit from images. So therefore let's go forward now and take a look at different types of images. I want to start with the obvious, which are images of articulation. I'll then take a look at some charts and tables, which in a, their own way are images. Move on to waveforms, which is relatively recent if you're actually outside a university acoustics laboratory. And then go off and perhaps move more in the direction of right brain and this thing of holistic and visualization and look at images and their association with targets we have in pronunciation teaching and finish by looking at live images that is not something that's in a picture on a PowerPoint or in a picture on a wall but that is actually happening in front of our students as we uh, work with them in the classroom. So this is the map and after each one of these areas I'll, I'll stop briefly and we'll go to the chat box and I'll, I'll let you ask me questions then because I should warn you that I'm incapable of actually keeping my thoughts together as a speaker and reading the chat box simultaneously. So you can by all means chat to each other through the chat box but I won't be looking at it until we get to one of the natural breaks in, in the uh, in the webinar. Okay, so if I can go forward, here we go. And uh, this is the sort of stuff that we're familiar with, either from when we uh, trained as English teachers or did our English degrees, or from the sort of stuff that comes up in course books. This is the sort of stuff I used all through the 80s. Simple line diagrams, because color was way too expensive. But um, efficient anyway, they allowed me to actually point out the different articulators that were being used. And from there you can go on, and I would go on if my computer would do that. There we go. We can get some color in. Obviously this improves the diagrams. But today with photography so cheap, because we work on digital platforms basically 90% of the time, then you can get as sophisticated as you want. Um, here is the, the cutaway head sort of thing, you know. The only, the only thing is, yeah, it's way more sophisticated than the line drawings that I used in the 80s. 
but I don't think it actually helps all this sophistication. And with some of the images we'll be looking at today, it might be that I'm just too old and need to leave the profession and retire. But I think sometimes we allow technology to cloud the issue rather than uh, simplify things. And the last diet picture I've just shown for me, if I want to talk about bilabial, the picture has way too many distractions in it to be of any use to me. Um, the sort of thing I actually like to have because my work takes me from place to place. I don't have a classroom which I can call my own. So I like to have pictures either usable um, on the whiteboard or I can stick on the room, on the wall, or I can project onto the screen through my PowerPoint. But I like to have pictures which are unlabeled and save me the, the um, business of having to draw the mouth every time I want to talk about the articulation of a sound. I find a simple picture like this incredibly useful to have with me in one form or another. This is more sophisticated. This is from a colleague, Judy Gilbert, who was one of the people who most influenced me back in the mid 80s when I started taking a serious interest in pronunciation. She's the grand old lady of pronunciation teaching and her whole life has been dedicated to making pronunciation accessible to the ordinary student, not to dedicated teachers like ourselves or to specialists in phonetics. And in one of her recent publications, she used some beautiful images throughout in the publication. Um, here, the, the typical in the middle, the, the side diagram where she tries to differentiate between uh, continuance fricatives and stop sounds, continuance on the left and the stops on the right. And in this case, between buzz and but, uh, the diagrams, the pictures at the bottom are interesting because these are taken from the back of your mouth and so the picture on the left is with the continuant um, buzz and the picture on the right shows what happens to the tongue looking from the back of the mouth towards the front when we say but and we can compare the tongue position in the, in the two. This is the idea. Now actually, it took me quite a long time to work out what those pictures were. And when I say a long time, not at a single viewing, I actually had to go back several times before I twigged what it was that I was looking at. So here are some beautiful pictures that wouldn't have been possible in the 80s for me, where I only had a piece of chalk and a blackboard, and therefore it would seem to be in advance, but I, I wonder actually if they are, I wonder how much they can be useful to students who can't make one or other sound. The pictures I found most useful come from this site, which was put up some time ago by the University of Iowa, and which is um, um, a website showing the sounds. Initially, it was just American English, then went through to Spanish and now has German, and which is available as an app. But if you go in and look at the consonants, for example, then this is what you come across. So staying with the, the stop sound T, we get um, the famous mouth diagram and in the center within the square and in stronger color, you actually get the, the, the point of attention where the point of articulation, of course. Um, further down below the mouth diagram, you get two options. And one is animation with sound because the diagram is actually an animated GIF and the tongue will move through all of the process of making the tuh sound and you can see the tongue. But you can also, if you go to the right where it says step-by-step -step description, you can actually um, uh, take each position from hold uh, to through to release. You can actually close, hold, release. You can take the three positions and it's animated for you. So you can take your students through these three positions. But this is very nice. There's also a video which accompanies it which is the woman on the right, her face, you can see her making the words telephone, attack and loot. Um, and you, again, you think, wow, video, fantastic, we'll see it all. But actually, of course you don't, because what matters with a sound like tuh is happening inside your mouth and her lips barely give any evidence whatsoever. So it's a nice addition, but sometimes, as with quite a lot of uh, new technology, it doesn't really add anything to what we already had.
the animated GIF, however, I, I find very useful, and my students have all said that they really like it. It clarifies things. At a much simp simpler level, um, diagrams like this, and these we can do ourselves at home, these are really simple to do, are of fantastic use, especially when you compare them to the same diagram for the student's mother tongue, in this case, Spanish. And this very simple comparison, the first time I did it, I wasn't very sure what the outcome would be, but students are amazed to see the difference in tongue position. They then start fooling around inside their mouth because initially they reject the image I've shown of the dental Spanish T or D, and then they discover that it's a pretty accurate representation of what's happening, and then they look back at the English one with the uh, tip of the tongue on the alveolar ridge, and they start fooling around there, and it's all prompted, all this messing around in their mouths and feeling their mouths and feeling when it looks Spanish and when it's uh, English. It's all prompted by these very two simple diagrams. Uh, diagrams with vowels are harder because vowels happen without any point of articulation, which of course is what means that they are vowels as opposed to consonants. So diagrams with vowels are um, actually harder to draw and you can see here from Trio 3, which is um, used widely from uh, what I can see, that the best we can do is perhaps show the shift in tongue position and get students to look at the diagrams while they make the sounds and feel how their tongue is moving and changing position. But of course, to be able to feel that presupposes that they can make the sound. And if they can make the sound, why are we showing them diagrams of how the sound is made? So these diagrams are interesting, but it does bring up a chicken and egg situation. And I would also add that I actually am very nervous about the pictures of lips. Because if I go ear, my lips barely move. And if I go air, again, my lips barely move. And what I have found with a lot of the images that are available commercially is that they focus on things that I'm not too sure are actually central to making a, a sound successfully. In this case, this big focus on the massive difference in lip shape for air, where when I say chair, my lips barely change shape in the part which is the vowel. Um, the same happens there with Judy Gilbert, and again she's combined line diagrams with photographs of lips, um, okay, doctored, photoshopped, photo, uh, photoshopped photographs, but essentially photographs of lips. And I would say of all of this, it's perhaps the, the, the uh, indicator of shift in uh, tongue position, but also shift in, in jaw position. Um, is more useful than these sort of semi-photographs of lips. Because if I go I, my lips again don't necessarily start as open and move to as neutral a position as in the pictures. These are images of articulation and as I say, along comes technology and it gives us all sorts of detail. This is a more sophisticated website than the Iowa website I showed you earlier. But although it's more sophisticated in terms of its uh, use of image and graphics, I don't think it's any better. Uh, and I'm not too sure, as I say, that some of the stuff that we see is a true reflection of what happens when we make certain sounds. So that is images of articulation, which clearly I think are useful, but uh, I've put in some um, doubts about how useful some more recent images are. I'm going to turn my attention to the chat box and please use the next couple of minutes to ask me questions or to make any comments or add to what I've said about your own experience using this sort of image. Anybody? Here we go. Thanks, Paco. Yeah, you said you taught pronunciation, so you've got to be pretty familiar with these. And yes, different sources provide the image that you're looking for yourself. Um, 
and I cast around constantly. I'm always going back into Google, Google Images. You'd be surprised what's there. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Yeah, I, it seemed, um, I thought, should I be doing this? But actually, it's very powerful. And students really get a shock to discover how different the two are. I totally agree, Chris. And I'm, you know, I've got to put my hand up. I'm as guilty as all teachers. I used to massively, massively over-exaggerate um, voicing, for example, where, um, and then discovered at the end of words, for example, voicing is almost negligible and may even disappear totally. So I had students doing things that I'd read in Gimson were part of the sound I was aiming at, and the truth is they weren't, and I had massively over-exaggerated. Over I think different learners will find it, uh, will have different difficulties, Syed. For example, when my friends try to get me to pronounce Polish properly, there are some palatal consonants that I really struggle with. And it was a, an eye opener for me that I couldn't easily make these given my knowledge of pronunciation. Um, so just showing the picture isn't a guarantee of success, but the picture gives students something to tie into what they're trying to do inside their mouth. I think that is the, the issue. Uh, thank you, Chris. Huh. I'm glad it was. Yeah, and the images just add, and it, remember every time you show them an image, you're accessing a different part of their, their memory system or their learning system. Remember that right brain, left brain. And so it will, will add, yeah. All oh, right, that's, yeah, Chris, that's also nice. I love doing pronunciation work where they're, they're not allowed to hear anything because it forces them to look at visible features in the mouth. So actually some sounds, especially vowel sounds, are easily differ differentiated because of what's happening with the lips uh, and, and the mouth shape, and that's massively visible. And by cutting out the sound, you get them to focus on the image, and then you bring back the sound, and they've got image and sound. And once again, we're accessing different areas of, of uh, their learning systems in their brain. Okay, thank you for that. Let's go back and move on to charts and tables. And of course, this is the chart. This is the famous chart. And I got a real shock when I saw this. Um, brilliant, fine. I'm doing phonetics at Oviedo University as part of the English degree. I need to know about this. I understand that. I find the chart is of limited value within my own work, save when I'm actually working with teachers who are trying to improve their pronunciation. In that case, I can use the left hand, the top of the chart to show them, look, we're going deeper and deeper back into the mouth. We're going from bilabial through to dental alveolar and uh, so on and so forth. And therefore we're talking about where I'm making this consonant. And on the left, we're talking about how I'm making the consonant. So in the sense of giving them these two axes, and then you add the voice voiceless thing, voiceless on the left, voiced on the right, when there's two in the same box. Um, that's useful. The full chart, as we're looking at now, I only use very occasionally because I just think it's funny to actually tell students if they're familiar with the chart of consonants for English. I think it's fun sometimes to go in and show them the full chart and they recognize, oh, I don't know what that symbol is. And I say, okay, but look, it's a voiceless, bilabial fricative can we make it and we 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 mess around in class and then the students pick another symbol they don't know and they look at where it's made and how it's made and they they basically fool on in class trying to make it but other than that um and these charts are all a bit intimidating especially as my background wasn't in, in linguistics i mean i come from a science so I look at what it's all about. But, it, um, you know, it has its value with certain types of students and certain levels of perfection. And everything I've said about the chart for consonants obviously goes for the chart for vowels. The thing was, you 
university when I was studying at university to get through second year phonetics. I knew this was going to come up in the exam. And so I'm, I've got a fairly photographic memory and I just learned this thing for the English files, not the whole chart we're looking at here. I learned this thing for the, the English uh, uh, monophon vowels, the pure vowels. When I went into the exam, sure enough, there it was, you know, and I put the dots in the right place and put the symbols in the right place, got full marks for the exercise, hadn't a clue. In it. And this again is one of the things that I panic about when I see some of these charts appearing in classrooms or appearing in course books, that very seldom have I met any serious attempts to actually tie the chart into our learners' actual physicality of pronunciation. And if you don't do that, I don't think these charts are of any value whatsoever. Um, a simple way of using them if they're in your room and, and uh, you're sort of thinking, I can't get rid of them, they're part of the room furniture, or they're, they're in a course book you're using, I would say that a, a simple way of using them is simply to show the chart for the English files. I'm obviously working to a UK model, but this chart is available for other models of English. And compare it to the Spanish files. And my students always get a shock because they have this sort of image that sums up how incredibly awful it is to make English vowels. And then I say to them, well, is the picture so awful? And we spot that Spanish E and English E are relatively similar. And Spanish uh, U and English U are pretty much the same. And that the E is more or less the same. They also actually then spot that the sound they make, which is a, a mid-open sound, and at the back, which is the O, um, it's like in no man's land compared to English sounds in that part. And that Spanish A is also very close to several English vowels. And they realize these are gonna be problematic. They are so unlike what is around them in terms of English sounds that are supposedly made in a similar way. So it's a nice little exercise that I don't linger on very much at all, but just flagging up similarities and flagging up Spanish sounds that are going to be taken through to English with great difficulty because English is far more complex in those areas. That's a very simple way of doing it. Working with teachers when I'm helping them with their own pronunciation, I actually ask them, do they know what relationship that very famous uh, quadrant ha has with their own mouth? And again, it's staggering. It's, it's, I would estimate easily over 95% of the teachers I've worked with, and my own students obviously never, but with the teachers I've worked with who I feel should have some knowledge, they can't locate in terms of their own mouths the vowel chart. And when I show them, how this vowel chart with its close front or open front and so on vowels, how it relates to the mouth and how E is close in front because it's where your tongue is positioned in the mouth when you're making it. I can't do this all here because it's a webinar, but actually um, showing students and going through the sounds and letting them feel in their mouths it makes the vowel quadrant have some sort of value. It gives it a value because it relates it to where each vowel is made within our mouths. And this is actually what the vowel quadrant tried to reflect. But the fact that it's a diagram, a diagram reflecting our real mouths got lost many, many years ago and no one seems to want to bother to bring it back. And that therefore questions the value of the vowel chart as a teaching tool. Uh, another one that I picked up over the years and I find interesting is this one from Wells Long and Pronunciation Dictionary. And instead of dots, he's got splatters, like someone's fired a shotgun at different places on the vowel chart. And what Wells is reminding us of with this splatter effect is that there isn't a single position for each of the vowels of English. E is anything which is in the location of E. And there are multiple different sounds which would all be interpreted as E as long as they don't stray so far away from 
the sort of focus point as to enter the area of a or enter the area of it. So this is, I find an interesting diagram because the splatter effect allows me to say to my students, there is variation. And this splatter isn't from lots of speakers. This is what one speaker would be like if we recorded every time they made an ah sound and put all of those ah sounds very accurately on our little uh, vowel quadrant. In other words, each speaker varies in their way of making an individual vowel. And between speakers, there's also variation. And the value of this is I'm telling students, okay, don't get too hung up. There's lots of space for your particular way, as long as it doesn't get too close to a neighboring sound like e eh or like a, uh, for example. Um, this is the most famous uh, uh, chart. It's Adrian Underhill's chart. It's been with us for 30 years or so now. And it's in many classrooms around the world. Um, obviously, it is not the only way to do this. And sometimes I go into classrooms and think, actually, you know, it's like it's become the Bible, the gospel, and the only way you can talk about sounds is by reference to Adrian's chart. But um, there are developments, as with everything, because as Adrian would admit if he was here, there are weaknesses to his chart. You can't put the sounds of English in a box as tidy and as comfortable as that. So, for example, Mark Hancock recently, the modern English teacher, tried to get a more pedagogical view on vowels. It's very interesting the way Mark worked because he stuck schwa in the middle because it is the sort of default setting. Um, apparently, it's the last sound we make as we draw our last breath because it requires no tension in the lips and no um, tension in the, in the pharynx, in your throat or anything like that. It's a total relaxed default sound. And what Mark did was put the short vowels around it in the first ring and then put the long vowels and diphthongs around schwa in the outer ring. And actually you can follow out, following the spokes, if we conceive the ring as a, a sort of bicycle wheel. So from schwa we can go out to i in chin and then to e in teeth. Or you can go schwa and out to a and then on to r. And again, you, you'll spot the weakness here. We know that R is in a different place in the vowel quadrant to A, which is front, and R is back. But um, Mark's just trying to play out this idea of uh, the schwa, and then the A, and then the R, and produce something that could be used in class and that follows clear and pretty simple principles. Um, and gives you, if you want, an alternative to Adrian's chart, which, as I said, is ubiquitous. It's absolutely everywhere. I did something similar at the request of Paul Selix, and he asked me to organize the consonants in, in a different way. He wanted something uh, new. And what I did was focus on what I felt learners uh, could actually identify with easily. And I think they identify with the, the, the articulators. And uh, obviously, individual sounds might use more than one of the articulators. But if we look at the, the top row, then our uh, I started with the lips. If you actually think about which consonant sounds require the lips as a principal articulator, then we make a funny combination because we get p, p, m, and w. And that, that combination isn't normally seen, but it seemed to me that it, there was nothing wrong in putting them together because they are all sounds that depend very, very strongly on the position and use of your lips. Similarly, further down the table, I brought together the sounds that essentially require um, exact positioning of the tip of the tongue. So t, d, n, and l wouldn't be together if you go to the IPA chart, but they come together on my chart because my students can make, for example, English t and d if they can make n. Because the n, which we do have in Spanish, for example, gets their tongue in the right position to actually be ready to make t or d. So charts and tables are useful, but we shouldn't um, feel worried about actually moving them around until they fit our pe pedagogical needs. And if you were uncomfortable, uncomfortable with some things and you've been using Adrian's chart, perhaps you'd like to make your own and a chart that helps you to help your students. 
Okay, again, before we go on to the waveforms, it's time for you to shut up and I'll bring up my chat box and um, try and answer your questions. Also, your comments, because you made really nice comments uh, in the previous visit to the chat box. Nothing coming up. Okay. So I'm going to go on because we've got still quite a bit to get through. And the next thing I'm going to go on with, um, I'll go through quite quickly because these, these waveforms, the first time I saw them was at the University in Oviedo in the Spanish department. They took me in and they showed me a spectrogram of, of different things. I was totally fascinated, but then you see my background was in physics and chemistry. So the minute I see waves, I'm already getting excited. Um, again, I'm not too sure as to their value for ordinary students. Okay, so the, the, the little red signaling at the bottom and the arrow points, look, the lack of wobbly lines at the beginning is because the English put is aspirated. Well, if you tell me it is, mate, that's fine, but um, what it actually means to our learners and what it shows up as in a waveform, I'm not too sure that there's much mileage to be gained there for ourselves in the classroom. Remember, I'm talking about average learners. I'm not talking about students doing phonetics on a university degree course, which is a different issue. They've got more and more sophisticated. And in this particular website, you can actually see in this case, it's the sound E, it's the long uh, front close vowel, as in T or C, and then it's just the American uh, reference to it rather than using the IPA symbol. And you can actually have a go at the sound and then carry it down, drag it down and, and drop it on top of the waveform that was produced by someone who's making the sound perfectly. Why well, isn't this exciting? Yes, but does it teach you how to make the sound? And I'm not too sure. It simply tells you your waveform is not the same as the waveform that the expert produced. So you've got it wrong. Okay, fine. I've got it wrong. Now what do I do? Um, that, that's my problem with this. We've got some really, really uh, amazing technology. But I'm not too sure that it's doing a useful job of substituting what we would do in the classroom anyway. You know, when my students get E wrong, I can tell them, no, no, that's not it. You didn't get it right. Do I need all of this to tell them? So I'm, I'm not too excited about that. I did use the, this sort of stuff pretty heavily when I was actually transcribing and editing all of the uh, interviews and all of the free speech that's on the CD that goes with my book on teaching pronunciation. I had to do a lot of stuff and I was using WavePad and at first, you know, obviously I was intimidated by it all. Um, what I did find was that it was interesting the way it actually highlighted an important issue for me, which was tonic stress, um, sometimes called sentence stress. So uh, this is me speaking. And if I were you, I wouldn't do it. And you can see the tonic stress on I, and you can see the tonic stress on, on do, and you can see the, the sort of total lack of stress on it. And then when I got a student to say this, because they were Spanish, they said, if I were you, I wouldn't do it. And this came up and you can see the waveform is quite different. And they can see it's quite different. And you can draw their attention to how strong the, the, uh, the range is how, uh, on the eye in my English compared to their Spanish influence version of the same phrase. So this I actually did find useful. Students could see that they weren't emphasizing I enough. And then we'd practice in class until we were getting the, the stress on the I, if I were you. And then the, the, their recordings actually came into line with my recording. So I'm using these images, but I'm using them with me in class to help them move in the right direction and to point out um, how to actually get the stress in the right place. I've done this also with teachers in training when we've looked at thought groups and um, what I've done is shown them this 
which is me speaking, if I were you, I wouldn't even look at him. And then I've asked them to match the words to the spectrograph and they quickly spot where I is and where look is. And they also realize that at him is just like so weak at the end. Whereas left to their own devices, they would say, I wouldn't even look at him. And the him would get way too much stress and the look wouldn't get enough stress. So they are images which I've used, which have supported me and which teachers have found useful. But as I say, because I'm there to help them understand the image. Um, again, a couple of minutes. Any comments, please? Any personal experiences? Oh, thank you for that, Chris. Yes, because if your student's background is, is Catalan, then you need to access that. And the other Chris, yeah, the revised charts, it's an interesting alternative. Thank you, Paco. I knew you'd say that, actually, because you're clearly doing a lot of work with pronunciation. Um, perhaps at a later date or via TESOL Spain, via the um, journal, you could Tell us how you use PRAP to correct pronunciation because people might be interested in that. Yeah, Mike, I, they, they, they are worth investigating, but um, I'm still anxious about just letting students loose on them by saying, go to Google Images and have a look uh, or, or go on your phone because you can do this on your phone now. And things like that. I think they need us there to help students understand the waveform and to connect that waveform to what we're trying to do. Yeah, Rebecca, that's fine. There's a big problem you see with mimicking with no teacher around. If you mimic and get it wrong, you've reinforced the wrongness. If you mimic four times and get each one of those wrong, you are really strongly reinforcing the wrongness. And that's my big anxiety about um, self-teaching pronunciation via the internet and things like that. The technology doesn't actually give the sort of constructive feedback that we do as teachers and therefore the student simply goes further and further down the wrong path or is doing everything sort of like by sheer experimentation. <laughs> ah, Rebecca, I, the first time I was shown that this thing, if I speak, it'll write what I'm saying. It, I was amazed how often we got it wrong. And I had to change my way of speaking to get the damn thing to write what I was saying. Um, and that was really funny because I've never had serious problems of people not understanding me because of my Northern English vowels. But this thing couldn't do book for love no money. And I had to do all sorts of things. So yeah, these, some of this online stuff you've got to be pretty careful with. It's the technology is beginning to be there, but it's a bit, bit, bit off at the moment. Okay, um, let's, let's go on because I'm taking longer than over this than I should have done. This I showed you before. I wanted to focus now on the pictures behind each symbol because these are the pictures that Paul drew. And what he was doing is coming off the back of earlier pictures he'd already drawn for another course book because this linking the picture to the doing of the sound, and in this case, if necessary, to the IPA symbol, this is matching sight and sound and producing good learning. Paul's earlier stuff comes from way back and it's the stuff that was an English file. And he did a series of pictures, one for each of the sounds. And it's this thing, you see it, you have the sound in this case, because it was considered important, you have the IPA symbol and you have an image. And it's these crazy images that worked so well for Paul with English file and that he repeated for that uh, late, uh, more recent book with Richmond. Uh, everyone's got their favorite. This is absolutely my favorite image because it's your shower in the form of the IPA symbol and someone's having a shower and then you get your sample words in a sample sentence. But the, the actual learning concept is, is not new. And of course, it's the, it's the actual fundament on which phonics is based. That students don't just hear the sound, they have the sound connected to an image, in this case, a still image of a snake for the sound s. And the teacher also does a live image, which is the teacher's arm moving in a snake-like fashion and showing the student uh, the movement, which the students imitate, 
plus the image, which the students will easily retain, at the same time as they're hearing the sound. And there's enough neurolinguistics out there for us to know that this combination is pretty powerful. It's movement, it's, so it's kinesthetic. It's image, so it's visual. And it's the sound, so it's, it's uh, arrow. Um, this is the basis of phonics. And it can be taken out from phonics and we can do it with learners of any age. We can make this three-way uh, connection. Movement, sight, and sound. And three is a number I really, you know, come back to again and again because three is very stable. If you have a chair with four legs, one of the legs is always too short and it wobbles. Or a table with four legs at a restaurant is always wobbling. Three legs is stable automatically, whatever the ground is like under it. So I'm always looking for three because it seems to be one of the universe's stable uh, numbers. This is um, connecting sites to sounds again. This is from project, from OUP project. And the I sound is connected to minute, the word minute, and the image of an alarm clock. And the I sound is connected to the image of night. And here is another one, which is uh, from a book. I'm sorry, I couldn't reference. And I, it's killing me that I can't, because it's, this is a great set of images. It's a clean street, which we as teachers would say, and there's the symbol E, but we've got two examples of the E sound. And then it's a clean street because people use the litter bin. I just think that's wonderful. Uh, nice images to go with the, the two sounds. Associations, of course, the possibly most famous is associate sounds with colors. And um, a course book done by teachers here in, in Asturias, done uh, by teachers in Gijón, actually works on all 44 phonemes of English and has, uses 44 different colors. So that's an interesting idea, although I think, um, sadly, it's ignoring the fact that quite a lot of those sounds our students already have because they speak a language and the languages coincide. Um, but this is well known, this using sounds and colors to help students retain the sounds. And you can perhaps have a green area of your classroom. So you have a big piece of green card and below it you have a folder. And every time a, word, a new word comes up and it's got the E vowel in it, then you would get their students to write the word or bring an image of the, the thing. If you can bring an image and put these words or images in the folder below the green part of the wall in the classroom. And then you can pull them out and go through them standing next to the green. Again, it's, deep subconscious levels because of neurolinguistics, green hooks into the sound and the two are connected in your brain and therefore are really easier to achieve. This is again coming to technology which you can buy in terms of courses. This is exactly what Blue Canoe Learning does because it talks about um, other muscles in the brain and about how we can actually access them and overcome resistance to new sounds and therefore, by using something visual and by matching a color and a symbol, we get blue moon or we get green tea. And in this way, the brain retains the quality of English vowels and because of the association of the vowels colors. So this is getting quite a long way away from, uh, from where we were at the beginning with uh, diagrams and charts. And this guy takes you even further away. Clement Leroy was very much about right brain and about holistic learning and pronunciation. And all of the activities in his book are of that nature. The book's old, but the activities haven't aged. And this is strongly recommended if you want to get away from traditional explanations and want to get deeper into right brain learners' ability to deal with things which are not apparently rational. This is um, working on vowel sounds or diphthongs. And basically the students sit and close their eyes and they have to imagine a color when you, the teacher, actually gives examples of the sound you want them to focus on. And I like this because you're not saying red is the red color and E is the green color and O is the blue color. You're saying to students, imagine a color, just listen to the sound and imagine a color. That power here is that it's so individualized. And students might want to talk to each other about which color they imagine, but it's pretty irrelevant. The key is each student 
actually imagines a color and begins to associate this sound with that color. What would you do with schwa? Uh, actually, it's a long time since I bothered with schwa because if you focus on schwa, the problem is it's an unstressed vowel and by focusing on it, you're stressing it. But if you feel the need to, one of the things I did was actually move away from the colors and all that sort of thing. And I got my students to think about this image because the joker in a pack of cards can stand in for any other card. It's totally fluid and flexible. It can be anything. And schwa can stand in for any of the five alphabet vowel letters. Um, sorry, my computer's just telling me it's dying. So I better plug it in again. And that's why I like the joker. It's, it's sort of, it can be anything. And schwa basically can be, many of the full vowels can be reduced to schwa. Another thing that I used for the same purpose was the Kleenex box and i'd say to my students look just forget about schwa don't give it any importance it's it's the throwaway sound you know just usar y tirar. just get rid of it don't focus on it just use it um so these are associations way way away from the explanations we looked at at the beginning i'm just trying to connect into that right brain part of my students and everyone has a bit of right brain even if you're predominantly left brain with er, for example, one day I realized that er was the sound that you make in Anglo-Saxon countries anyway, when you find something that's truly repugnant. So what I do is I show my students a picture of this, which is a uh, squid with chocolate sauce. And if you're not from Catalonia, you will find the whole idea of pouring chocolate sauce onto squid totally repugnant. And then I say, so this is like er, uh, and I make the sound. And then from there, I work back until they're making the sound. And perhaps we post up a little picture of squid with chocolate sauce on it. And when students come in, we work on words with that particular long vowel, which is reported to be the most important of the vowel qualities of English, even uh, when you're working uh, not towards a native speaker accent, you're just trying to be internationally intelligible. What I'm doing here is getting totally away from any explanations that might be sort of left brain explanations and actually just working on images that might cement the, the difference in my students' mind. This is, oh God, we've been backwards and forwards on e -I. But uh, if I had time, I'd tell you an anecdote, which is a true story about a colleague of my wife's working in a hotel in London and actually finding a shit in the shower and the manager thinking it was a sheet that she'd found and her explaining that it wasn't, that it was indeed a sheet. Um, here's another anecdote that I tell my students. It's all about the queen and how she had uh, such a terrible life and how she lives in one wing of Buckingham Palace and her husband lives in another wing because she doesn't like him. And how one day she opened the newspapers and there once again were her dreadful net, um, grandsons in the newspapers, Harry in the paper again. And the poor woman was so disgusted, she went, oh. And I've told that really quickly. I embellish it when I tell it. But actually, when I get to the moment when the Queen goes, oh, referring back to something one of you, one of you said earlier in the chat box, I don't make any sound. I just pull my mouth and go. And the students see my face, and I repeat this, and I go, so I'm giving them an association with the story, but I'm also giving them a live image. And this helps them when I then go, oh, they focused on my mouth and on my lip shape and they make oh with me. But the story is their reference point. It's crazy. These are way away from anything that's rational. And they've developed over the years, but I found they've had a huge impact on my students because they're so memorable. And again, just referring back to Clement Leroy and his book, this is the area, the sort of area he takes his students to again and again in his little activity. Two minutes, very briefly. I've gone on quite a long time. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, the snakes. Young learners love snakes. But of course, with a consonant afterwards. Yeah, yeah, the diphthongs really do have a lot of mouth in them. So to show them without 
sound is very, very useful. They focus on the image and then you add the sound later. Marta? Okay, that's interesting. Oh, you should write about how you do that, Marta, for the, the TISL journal. I do, and I do use the vowel quadrant, but usually it's with teachers who I feel need some help actually understanding it. And then once they've understood it, it's very useful for them because they have a mental picture about where to be in their mouths. Okay, well, let's finish off. And the live images that I'm talking about here, um, the first one is me. And, and it's what I've been doing through the camera, <laughs> for good or bad effect, I don't know. But I'm making here. And if I wanted to make the voice equivalent, I'd put my, my, my thumb and finger to my throat and I'd go, mm. and these are live images. And I can go, mm. and the students see that basically my mouth's in the same place. And then I can go, mm. Mm. and they see that the two are connected by the vibration in my throat. And the image I use to show that on my finger and thumb. There's lots of things I've done like this with my students in class. And it's slightly embarrassing being center of attention, but then we're teachers, it's what we do. Demonstration is natural. And that's actually how you learn to serve in tense. You watch someone do it, and then you try to do it. And they might give you some help as to where you can improve, but essentially it's through demonstration that you're learning. It's natural. It appeals to multiple intelligences. There's uh, movement, there's physicality, it's visual, you can hear it. So this is good, we know this helps the brain. It's free of meta-language. It's really interesting. You don't need any language, you just need the demonstration. Compared to the Gimson explanation at the beginning, demonstration is massively powerful. It's immediate and on demand. So anytime a student needs a demonstration or they just need redirecting, we can do it, we can do it now, we can do it for them when they want. It's easily exaggerated, so they stop the key features, then repeat it, slow down, speed it up, said loud, said quiet, whispered, said without sound. And it's, it's enjoyable, whether it's you that's doing it or them that's doing it. So these are live images and they're, they're very, very powerful if you can demonstrate things. And people have already commented on the value of demonstrating lip movement in certain vowels or diphthongs especially. Um, live images. I went for aspiration on Google Images. I went to Google Images for aspiration. This is what I got. I got text. Isn't it amazing? But of course, you all know, I'm sure you know anyway, that if you take a piece of paper, I'm hunting around for a bit of paper, <laughs> didn't think, and you actually just go paper, then you've demonstrated aspiration. And look at all that wasted words. And we can demonstrate this so quickly, so easily. Voicing, why talk about it? Just get your students to go and they get excited. Some of them have never noticed that their, vo their vocal cords vibrate sometimes and not others. And they start giggling. Okay, you've had way more impact than any description of the sorts you've got here that I pulled off. Let me insist from Google Images. <laughs> and again, uh, live images, your movements in class. Once again, Clement Leroy suggesting we associate sounds with specific movements. He gives some pretty clear indicators here. I have my own movements. So you can, uh, and I mentioned earlier, the, the thing, finger thumb thing. If I want to show the shortness of a short vowel, then I do a chopping movement with my hands close together because I'd indicate short and this chopping action to get them to shut off the short vowel. If I want a long vowel, I pull as if I'm pulling an elastic band. These are the sort of movements I'm doing. And a movement that I didn't ever expect to have in my, in my um, sort of weaponry is to do with this, this tale I tell about coming home and finding the fridge empty on a Friday night and going, oh. And I associate it with opening the fridge door. So I open the fridge door in front of my class and, and go, oh. And later I can actually use the fridge door opening movement 
to get my students to remember this dip song. So these are all live images. And as I say, I use them constantly in class because of all the benefits they bring. And coming back to the very beginning and, and winding up for the ah sound, as one of you mentioned right back in the beginning in the chat box, I use an apple. And I might not have an apple on hand in the classroom. And if not, I just tell them to imagine an apple and to imagine biting into an apple, a big apple, a big juicy apple. And by the time they've done this, they've opened their mouths, which is the fundamental issue for people like uh, learners from Holland who make the F because they don't open their mouths enough to make the A. Getting them to physically place the apple in their mouths using live images like this is the way I would go um, to get them where I want them. So we've looked at images for articulation. These are classics and there's lots of space for them. Charts and tables, uh, they were used to that from phonetics courses. They need careful use in the class because it's hard for students uh, to relate them to what's happening inside their mouth. And we as teachers are gonna have to work to make those charts come alive. Waveform, I think this is all going to move forward. I think we will see progress in this area. And um, I think there is uh, some use to be had from waveforms, and, I, and I'm using them, so I have to. But all of those first three are very much uh, to do with left brain and logic and uh, a sort of scientific approach. And the associations and live images we've just looked at now are much more to do with right brain, holistic learning, and visualization and multiple intelligences. It's the combination, of course, neither one nor the other. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to go back to the chat box and answer any more questions, but also invite you to share your experiences. So thank you very much, and I hope that's been useful. That has been very useful. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, while people are, are writing questions and comments in the chat, if anybody has anything that they want to ask or anything that they'd like to say to, to Robin, do say so in the chat. Um, thank you very much from TESOL Spain. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, repeat something that you said a couple of times uh, during the webinar um, to some people talking in the chat. If you do have a teaching tip or something that you'd like to share with everyone about how you teach pronunciation or how you teach anything, um, Send us, a, send us a, something for the, for the TESOL Spain newsletter. We'd be absolutely over the moon to receive it. So uh, if you want to find out more about that, go to the TESOL Spain website. Uh, Rebecca, who's on the chat there as well, um, is the person that you would need to send it to. Maybe, Rebecca, do you want to put your email address in the chat so that people know where to send it to, if you have something that you want to share? And it doesn't have to be a long article. It can be a couple of paragraphs long. Uh, and we would be absolutely uh, over the moon to receive anything that you would want to send. So thanks for mentioning that, Robin. <laughs> I completely agree, Mandy, with the, the length. You know, we sometimes panic about sending stuff because we think we have to write an article. No, what would be totally brilliant is for people to come off the back of the webinar and send in their own way of using images in class. And it could be like uh, 100 words and that's it. Thank you. There's the, there's the email address there, TESOL Spain Publications, all together at gmail.com if you do have something that you'd like to send. Okay, we'd love to see your comments, mm, re reactions to, or something that you'd like to share. That would be wonderful. And Mandy, how do people see the, get the PowerPoint or, I mean, I can yeah. put the PowerPoint on my website. That's, right. that's the easy way. Yeah. Also, if you if you don't mind sending it to us, we can put it yep. on the TESOL Spain webpage afterwards as well, if that's all right. Okay, brilliant. Yep. So anybody who would like to have a look at the PowerPoint or, or have a PDF copy of it, then we'll upload it to the website. And the recording will be on the website over the next few days. That will be uploaded there as well. So um, I've learned lots. <laughs> so thank you very much. Very interesting. Lots of things that I hadn't really thought too deeply about, which I'm now reflecting on, as I'm just about to rush off to class and we're going to do some pronunciations. <laughs> Good to have, uh, have that in the back of my head before I go. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people uh, participating so enthusiastically, as usual, in the chat. Hey, thank you, everyone. Bye. Yes. Goodbye. And see you all in Oviedo. Yes, yeah, see you all in Oviedo, all of you. <laughs> March next Bye, year. Bye, everyone. Bye.